Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone in Booksworth. Oh, you're all wide awake, aren't you? Let's try that one again. Good morning, everyone in Booksworth. Morning. And morning, everybody out there watching this video as well, wherever you may be. It's lovely to have you. Glad that you've joined us. Um, you never thought that Booksworth would be the centre of an international church, did you? <laughs> Well, it's great that you've joined us, whether it's from just down the road or, uh, or from thousands of miles away. It's lovely that you're here with us. We're doing the service of Holy Communion for the 16th Sunday after Trinity. And uh, if you're in church, the service begins on page one of the service books. But first, um, I'm just going to... Uh, no, I'll publish the Bands of Marriage at the end because I don't want it going on the video. All right. So remind me at the end to publish the balance. So, um, page one. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And over the page, let's all pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A moment of silence for confession. We consider the things we've done wrong. We reflect upon the good we haven't done. Now covered by the blood of Jesus, at the top of page three, we all pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Praise God in the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord God of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders, that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our lives end through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now do have a seat because we've got our readings. Is Mike to bring them to us? Good morning. Morning Mike. The first reading is taken from Ezekiel chapter 18 the word of the Lord came to me what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel the 
Parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is, it is only the person who, who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness, they have committed and do what is lawful and right then they shall live because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed they shall surely live they shall not die yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is unfair O house of Israel are my ways unfair is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from all your transgressions and you have and you, that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit why will you die O house of Israel for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone says the Lord God turn then and live this is the word of the Lord thanks be to God Let's please stand, stand for the gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority has he by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority Jesus said to them I will also ask you one question if you tell me the answer then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of a human origin they argued with one another if we say from heaven he will say to us why then did you not believe him but if we say of human origin we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet so they answered Jesus we do not know and he said to them neither will I tell you what authority I am doing these things What do you think? A man had two sons. He, he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which then of the two did the will of this of his father they said the first Jesus said to them truly I tell you the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you but John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him 
but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed in him and even after you saw it you did not change your minds and believe him this is the gospel of the lord praise to you o christ thank you Jesus, we pray that you'll speak to us today. We pray that your words will be powerful and will impact on our lives. Amen. Have a seat. Well, I'm going to say um, two words that are extremely unpopular today. In fact, the two words that I shall say are considered rude and foul language in some circles. Nevertheless, I'm going to say them all the same. Are you ready for these two horrible words or two words that some people consider to be horrible the first one begins with p here goes personal responsibility personal responsibility what did you think i was going to say it's a very unpopular pair of words among some social theorists the social theorists who say that certain kinds of behavior can be and must be excused because it was not a person's fault that they were conditioned by their surroundings or even that they have a genetic predisposition to certain kinds of behaviour. And this may cover a, a range of, a whole range of behaviours from inappropriate sexual behaviour to violent behaviour and a whole range of other criminal activity and even unethical ways of dealing in business. Oh. It's not his fault. He was amongst his fellow stockbrokers and they all cheat like that. Oh, it's not her fault. She was brought up in a family of shoplifters. You know, she just learned how to do it from them. Oh, it's not his fault as he was a soldier only following orders. Oh, it's not her fault. Her genetic disposition makes her like that. And when you load all the blame for people's unethical behaviour on their surroundings, their circumstances, or even their genes, then you end up excusing anything and blaming everything apart from the individual. And it creates a culture of victimhood and it disempowers individuals from making positive, positive choices in their lives. However, the Bible is really clear. Everyone, everyone is responsible for their actions. Everyone is responsible for their actions. It's a part of the way in which we have been created, that higher creation, that we have control of what we do and God holds people individually accountable for what they do the scriptures say and this is a theme that ran through both of our readings today and it runs through the whole of the scriptures like the words Blackpool do through a stick of rock unless you're in Philly of course in the Old Testament reading God was speaking through the prophet Ezekiel to the people of Judah who were in exile. Their ancestors had sinned against the Lord and in 587 God visited with them with judgment using the Babylonian army and conquered them and sent them into exile. And now they were in living in exile. Some of them were saying, huh, well, why should we bother keeping the law of God? God is doing his thing of punishing the sins of the fathers on the children. Have you heard that phrase? Punishing the sins of the fathers on the children? So what's the point in trying to live in obedience to please him? Because we're going to cop for it anyway. Uh, and that's why they were quoting the proverb. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So the children are paying for something that the fathers have done before them. Here's the major problem. They have misunderstood those words of the, visiting the sins of the, 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 the fathers on the children. They've misunderstood those words in Exodus 34. 
Because if you read the text properly, God only punishes the sins of the fathers upon the generations who hate him. Only the generations who hate him. And he shows mercy, that text says, unto countless numbers who love him and keep his commandments. And they misunderstood the scripture. And this, and the perception that God is unjust, is exactly what Ezekiel sought to correct. And this is the part of the passage, sadly omitted by the lectionary, but which I will now read to you now, which illustrates how this works. Suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look at the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbour's wife or have sexual relations with a woman during a period. He does not oppress anyone but returns what he took in pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery but gives his food to the hungry. He provides clothing for the naked. He does not lend to them at interest or take a profit for them from them. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between two parties. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Now I love that because it encompasses, it encompasses all the different kinds of ethical behaviour. From, from violence to sexual morality to economic, to economic justice. I love that. But then in verse 10 it says this. Suppose he has a violent son. And sometimes children do turn out to be completely different from their parents, don't they? Suppose he has a, a violent son who sheds blood or does or does any of those other things, though the father has done none of them. He eats at the mountain shrines, he defiles his neighbour's wife, he oppresses the poor and needy, he commits robbery, he does not return what he took in pledge, he looks at the idols, he does detestable things, he lends at interest and takes a profit. Will such a man live? He will not. Because he has done all these detestable things, he will be put to death and his blood will be on his own head. But then it goes on. But suppose this son has a son who sees all the sins his father commits and though he sees them, he does not do such things. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look at the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbour's wife. He does not oppress anyone or require a pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery but gives his food to the hungry which is what we should be doing. And he provides clothing for the naked. He withholds his hand from mistreating the poor and takes no interest or profit from them. He keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die. For his father's sins, he will surely live. But his father will die for his own sin, because he practised extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among his people. Yet you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father, since the son has done what is just and right, and has been careful to keep all my decrees? He will surely live. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parents, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. And he's really explaining what the meaning of Exodus 34 is. But if a wicked person turns away from this, all the sins they've committed and keeps my decrees, listen to this, now this is really, really powerful stuff, and does what is good and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offences they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord? 
Rather, I am not pleased. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things that the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that that person has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty of and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. It's powerful, isn't it? And the teaching is absolutely crystal clear. God holds every individual accountable for their own behaviour. They are in charge of their own lives and their own destiny. And they can make choices. Everybody knows the difference between good and bad. And you can make a choice. You can either choose in your life to do what your parents have done. And if they've done bad stuff, well, you can choose to do that. Or you can choose to turn away from that and say, no, I do not want to live like that. God holds every individual accountable for their behaviour. If a person persists in sin, he will punish them. If a person lived righteously, no matter what their parents have done, God will not punish them. And if they do wrong and then repent and turn away from their sins, God is delighted. Jesus said, there's a party in heaven every time. A sinner turns away from their sins. Likewise, in our Gospel reading, Jesus follows the same reasoning when he was challenged by the chief priests and elders as to where he got his authority from. He believes in personal responsibility. Now, when he's asked that question about where he got his authority from, he doesn't answer the question with a direct answer. Not, not because he's, he's sort of dodging the issue, but because there was a rabbinical tradition that you debate with dialogue, that you debate with dialogue. Rather like the Jewish joke, which goes like this. Question. Why does a Jew always answer a question with another question? Answer. Why shouldn't a Jew answer a question with another question. And that's what he's up to. And he tells the story of the father who owned a vineyard and asked his children to help. Oh, come on guys, it's hard work. Come on lads, come and help me. And one says, stuff that, I'm not doing that. And then changes his mind. And he goes and gets stuck in and he helps. And the other says, oh, goody two-shoes here. Oh, yes, Daddy, I'll do that. I'll do that for you, Daddy. Yeah? And then he, he slopes off and he does it. And, and here's the rub. The religious leaders at the time were those who assumed they were righteous. That they were, according to Jesus, like the son who said they would do the will of God. And then they didn't. They were found wanting. And the ones who the religious establishment counted as complete and utter waste of space, like that first son, were in fact the ones who responded to the preaching of John the Baptist and were now following the way of righteousness. And they'd repented of their sins. And they'd taken personal responsibility for their actions. And they had made a big change in their lives and they responded to the call of God. Yes, the Bible teaches personal responsibility that we take responsibility for the way we live. We're not victims. We can rise above it. And for anybody, there is hope. There is hope. 
and anybody can respond to the call of God and raise their game by his grace. But this passage is also about love and mercy and the grace of God. Because as in last week's story of Jonah, it's about the God of the second chance. That's what God is like. He's the God of the second chance. And he's the God of the third chance. And he's the God of the fourth chance. He could just declare, you did what? Strike one. You're out, mate. You're finished. And he would have every right to do so. But instead, he calls us back to himself. He calls us to repentance. And he calls us again and again and again, giving us a second and a third and a fourth chance. Because that's in his nature. He's a God who loves the people he has created. And he wants us all to come to himself. He doesn't want to see sinners die. So he persists in calling us to repentance right to the very end. And that was illustrated, brothers and sisters, wasn't it? So beautifully in the story of the thief on the cross. Because he's a God of love and mercy and patience. And all of us here are recipients of his grace. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God of the second and the third chance. I wouldn't be standing here now if you weren't. Amen. Let's stand and say the words of the Creed on page 7. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us sit or kneel as we come to God in prayer. When I say the words, Lord, hear us, please respond, Lord, graciously hear us. We pray that we may be those who are grateful for the grace and mercy we've received. And because of this, we pray that we would be those who do not judge others. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And so we pray for the words of your gospel to go out into the world to reach those who are sinners, those who commit acts of violence, 
those who commit acts of economic injustice, those who commit acts which are against the laws of God, those who are sexually immoral, those who do not love their neighbour as themselves. May your word go out and call them to yourselves, yourself. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for this nation as we work to combat COVID. We pray that we may take personal responsibility for our actions in preventing the stop of the, in preventing the spread of this disease. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for our government that God would give them wisdom. We pray for the NHS workers that God would give them strength and protect them. And we pray for scientists working on vaccines and cures. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those nations where they do not have a health service like we have and where the poor go untreated, where public health is less than it really should be. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those we know who are sick. We think of them and pray for them in a moment of silence. We lift them to Jesus. Hold them, Lord, in your hand. Touch them with your healing power. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And we pray for those who are about to get married, particularly as they have just heard that their wedding numbers have been halved. We pray that nevertheless, God would bless them. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please will you stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Do share a sign of God's peace. I'm going to use uh, Eucharistic Prayer D, which you'll find on page 28. Page 28 for our prayer of consecration. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your faces turn towards your world. In love you gave us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home, to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights.
Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the, to the darkness, Jesus came as your light, with signs of faith and words of hope. He touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and said, This is my body, given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it, and said, This is my blood, shed for you all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is now alive to plead with, to, and, and, they, and is alive to plead for us and for all the world. This is our story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Send your spirit on us now. By these gifts, we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We turn to page 12, and you all know these words. They're the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to say them all together now. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who tre trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And on page 14, God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love is a fulfilling of the law. Grant that we may love you with our whole heart and our neighbours as ourselves, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And together we're going to pray at the bottom of page 16. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest powerfully upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please stand. Well, we're really glad that you've joined us today either here in Booksworth or out there in uh, internet land. So, take responsibility for your own actions this week. Make sure you do. You're not a victim, yeah? You have the ability by the grace of God to do his will in this world. Make sure you go and do it. So, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen. Amen.